Linda for sharing. And I thank you everybody for allowing me to be here with us today. I want to say that it's always a privilege and I love it to worship God with us, especially here on Sabbath day. Is it alright if I take my mask off or should I? Okay, praise God, praise God. All right. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> well, since Glenda, you started it, I'm going to have to ask uh, anybody, two people at least, you know, if you have a testimony or something that you want to share with us to, this morning, please, I would like to ask at least two people to stand up and share what God has blessed them through this week. Anyone? I hadn't been home in many years, wandering around, doing my own thing. And when I turned 60, I called my mother and I said, do you believe that I'm still alive? And she said, no, son, I don't. <laughs> the kind of life I've led. And I just praise God, I, I am still here, ain't I? <laughs> praise God. I'll take one more. One more. This last week, um, our con as our container was getting packed out, I uh, was able to talk to my um, potential employer, and it's we've had some trouble with um, getting a hold of each other, I guess you could say. And I just praise God that, um, that he is trustworthy and that no matter what things look like in the moment, that we can trust that he will be able to, or not be able, that he is going before us, that he is opening doors and closing doors as he knows is best. Thank you very much for sharing your testimonies to us this morning. You know, it's important to do that because it inspires us and it helps us, it encourages us to also be open or be alert or to open our eyes and see God's blessing in our lives. And you, you never know, the story that you share may encourage someone else in the church. Well, I also have a lot of praises, but let me just cut it down to one. I want to praise God for the opportunity that we have on the uh, beach, that camp meeting. It has really taught me a lot. The very most important thing that I learned there is that I really need uh, the Holy Spirit and that I need more love in my life towards my family, my children, my wife, my church members, and I'm not gonna leave myself out, but of course myself too. So I praise God for the opportunity to be there and to learn that really I, I am just a messed up person and I'm, I'm empty and that I need God every day. I need God every day. And I want to say thank you all for, thank you to the church board for allowing us to use the church tent. Thank you, thank you to the Porter family for lending us their generator. That's how we were able to have light. And thanks to the Powers family for their van. We were able to get the things that we don't have or that we need during our camp meeting. While you are sitting in your seat, I would like to request one thing, please. Please pray for me. Pray for me that the subject that I'll be presenting to us would be from God and that everything that I say 
would be that God want me to say, not just uh, me just throwing out ideas, but that it'll be God speaking through me to us all. Well, with that said, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you today with my families, my brothers and sisters. And Father, thank you for this life and strength. Lord, as we are about to open your words today, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And Father, please speak through me and hide me behind your cross. And Lord, I also need your courage and your strength. And Father, please forgive us. We've started our divine service and we have not uh, inquired of you. And so, Lord, I ask that you bless this moment and that you give us protection and guidance. And, oh, Lord, please, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you, if there be any evil spirits in your sanctuary, I pray in Jesus' name that you cast them away, far away, and that you cleanse us from all our, our sins, Lord. Father, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we'll, we will be looking at Matthew 24 and Revelation 13. We're going to be doing a little bit of a comparison between the two chapters. Not everything, but it'll be mostly on deception and fear. Deception and fear in the end times. I know that we're all familiar with Matthew 24. It is the chapter or book that talks about the signs of Jesus' coming and of the end of time. So what we're, we're going to do basically is look at Matthew 24 and see what Jesus said there about deception and fear and then Revelation 13, and we're going to do the same thing too. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew 24, and we'll be starting in verse 3. Matthew 24, starting in verse 3. If you don't have your Bibles, please follow along on the screen. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ. and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, and will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets shall rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. Now in this slide, we'll be looking at how many times Jesus had mentioned the word deception or deceive.
Three times in verse 4, Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceives you. In verse 5, continue on, For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive, there you go again, many. Then many false prophets shall rise up and deceive many. Deception is repeated there three times. And in the Hebrew writing, or shall I say in, as I was studying last night, it's not only in the, in the Hebrew writing, but it seems like it's a technique that writers do when they want to emphasize a point, they often repeat the phrases or re repeat a word to make their point. When something is repeated in, in the Hebrew writings, it is meant to emphasize the importance of the concept. And the last point I have there is that Jesus knows that in the end times, deception will be one of Satan's powers of drawing God's people away. Now, in uh, re repetition or repeating the same phrase, another example that we can look at is the story of Jesus, of course, uh, by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, one of the reasons they uh, repetition can be done is because of accountability. Whether that story is true or right or wrong. Now, I would say police officers or investigators do this when they take, uh, you know, different people's uh, story or side of the story and they look if they have some connections together, then they would often say if they do meet at some point or they are close enough, then they would say that it is true. I think another point is perspective. Perspective. I think that that's one other point of uh, repetition. Anyways, in our world today, lies or deception is everywhere. You would Growing up, let me, let me just share a little bit of my testimony. I, I love watching movies. And I, I'm so soaked in this world that doesn't exist. And <laughs> that's what I talk about every day when I meet my friends. I talk about movies at school or at home. But as I came to know Christ, you know, I've learned that there are some things that we just don't do as Christians. So one of the things that I gave up is actually watching, you know, not all movies are bad, some are good. So anyways, you go Facebook, YouTube, even the news today, a lot of lies. And there's one important concept in the Bible that we have to understand about deception or lie. John 8, 44 says that you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Deception. Lie. I think that is very important for us as believers in Christ also to understand that we also need to move away from particularly lying. Because the Bible says that the thought Satan is the father of it. And if we practice it, if we keep on lying, then we are actually saying that we are the sons and daughters of the father, the one who's, who invented or came up with lying. 
All right. Let me go back to the verses in Matthew 24. Okay. All right. Do you see the word fear here? Probably not. Verse 7 to 10, if you can scan through it, I do not think so. Okay? All the way to verse 14. We don't see that. We don't see the word fear. But as I was studying this lesson, you see the word trouble. Jesus said it. Let me just go back. I'm so sorry. In verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. And as God was leading me, so I was studying the word, studying the Bible. When you look in the strong, real Greek Bible dictionary, the word they're troubled can also be used as frightened or fear. Now let's look at the list of what will cause fear in Matthew 24. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not <clears throat> troubled or fear, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrow. And then they will deliver you up to tribulations and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Christ knew or knows what's going to happen, and so he warns us about being scared or being afraid or being fear. And he lists pestilences, famines, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars. And then in verse 9, he says that they will deliver you up to, to tribulations and kill you. And of course, when we read, when we read these verses, we understand that fear is being implemented here. Fear is being used here. Of course, the Bible doesn't really spell it out, but, but as you and I read the Bible, you will, you will then see or sense that there is a sense of fear here that will happen in the end times. Now let's quickly jump to Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven and on the earth in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give bread to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no man may buy, no, no one, sorry, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. 
Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of the, of the man. His number is 6666. Six, six, six. So let's look at how many, or li like I mentioned earlier, deception and fear. So let's look at Revelation 13 and see how many times we tend to see the scenery of fear here. And he exercised all the authority, which also translates as power, of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Now, when we look at this in verse 12, we do not see, or I'm sorry, we, we may all see or can tell where fear comes in also. When it, it says that it exercises all the authority of the first beast, all the power of the first beast, we can look back in history and look at what the first beast did. And we can trace all the powers or all the authority that it exercises on the people. And it'll be clear to you that force or causing people to fear and give in is what the first beast also used. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. There again, cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be, to be killed. Another fear. You know, he's, the devil will be forcing people. He will be threatening people. And so the devil likes to use fear to implement his power on God's children. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, and that no one, no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So if you don't have the mark of the beast, if you don't have his name, then you won't be able to buy or sell. And that would put a lot of us, or just a lot of people in fear. We can already tell that by looking at our current circumstances today. And that no one, oh, sorry, it's repeated. Okay, let's move on. All right, deception in Revelation 13. I used verse 12 again, because later down the line, for example, verse 16, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. You see where I highlighted in yellow writings, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, that actually symbolizes God's people, or pe people in general, those who will be deceived by the devil mentally, and they will believe that what they are doing is right or for the right cause. And when, when it says, says on, on the, the right hand, hand, that speaks or symbolizes people who will actually, who may not intellectually believe it, but would submit. Submit to the devils or to Satan, not necessarily because they believe, it, but because they are afraid of the consequences. So they turn in or they give in so that they don't want any of the trouble. So when in verse 12 says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes in this particular phrase here, we can already understand that there will be people that would believe that this was the right thing that they're doing, 
But there are those that because of the fear factor, they will give in. They will give in to the deception. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives. Deception and fear. In the book of Matthew 24, Matthew talks about, or Jesus said, take heed that no man deceives you. So we see deception and fear going on. Now John the Beloved, who wrote the book of Revelation, you know, he doesn't have a, it. The book of John in the gospel is written by John the Baptist. So he doesn't have a, a gospel written for the life of Jesus. But Jesus then revealed to him the book of Revelation. And when you put these two stories together, what Jesus had told his disciples on the Mount of Olives and what Jesus revealed to John the, John the Beloved, you will then realize that Satan is using deception and fear in order to draw the people to himself or to win God's children. Now, you must say, why? Why are we even was wasting or spending our time studying this together? Jesus gave us the book of Revelation and Matthew so that we can study together, so we can be prepared. Jesus' first advice to his disciples in Matthew 24, verse 4, he says, Take heed that no man deceives you. You know, when we read that word, take heed that no man deceives you, it's simple, right? Take heed. Be careful. But let me ask you that question. How do you or how do I take heed? It's simple to read it and understand it. Well, what about the application? What do we do? What do I do to take heed? Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Study to show thyself a proof unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly defining the word of truth. So number one, we have to study the word of God. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17. The Bible says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We study scriptures. We look at the word of God. You see, it may seem boring to us. Why are we even talking about deception? Why are we even talking about fear? Please forgive me if and, and please as you're sitting down, please pray for me that I will not say anything that God does not want me to say. It's not meant to discourage you. What we are studying today is not meant to discourage you. What, I will, what I'm hoping for is that we realize these two things that the devil likes to do. He, he likes to deceive us, and if he can't deceive us, then he will force us. And when we realize these two things that are happening around us, please, please, at that very moment, realize that that is not God. 
That is not the work of God. That is actually the devil at hand. God does not force us. In fact, 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And this God who loves doesn't force us to do something that is against our will. Ephesians 4, 13 to 15 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be, chil be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Be, be not deceived. Study the word of God. God wants you and I to grow to mature in his word. See, and see that phrase, that we should not no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrines by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in, in love. May grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. And when Christ says, take heed, that's what we must do. We must study the word of God for ourselves and have a personal relationship with God. And also, this is one of my favorite verse in the book of Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny deny himself and take up his cross, how often? Daily, and follow me. You know, when I first hear this text, I was overwhelmed with emotions. I said, Lord, I want to follow you. To take heed, we must, at the very first thing, deny ourselves too. Deny ourselves. The first time I was, you know, I shared this first with our brethren, our Turkish brethren. You know, I, there's a little bit of difference of, you know, words. So the best way for me to d describe the word there, deny, is, is to go back and r remind of the time that Peter denied Christ three times. And that really helps our brothers and sisters to understand where this verse is coming from. You know, deny yourself. How do you deny yourself? Each of us need to ask ourselves that question. How do I deny myself? What am I holding on to? And how do I take up my cross daily? Jesus said, you must deny yourself first because if you don't deny yourself, you won't be able to take up your cross. See, you have to deny yourself in order to be able to take up your cross and then follow. It's not just a one day thing. Jesus said daily, take up your cross daily. And this is, I want to say, praise God because at camp meeting, you know, Another truth was revealed, and I was so blessed to learn that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is, is not just a one-time experience. It's a daily experience. We need to wake up every day, or before we do our work, we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us daily. For whoever decides to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Some advice from Paul, huh? I say then walk in the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. 
Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. In verse 22 to 26. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are in, to, and those who are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. Praise God. I praise God for his words. We need to stay connected to Christ every day. If we do not stay connected to Christ every day, then we will be weak in our Christian walk. It is only through our connection to Christ by living in, you know, through the Holy Spirit or by the power of the Holy Spirit that we will receive God's uh, strength and we will be able to stand against any form of deceit that Satan will throw against us. John chapter 15, verse 5 and 6, and I will end with this. See, at AWR, it's uh, my first time, I would say, really having uh, to see another kind of tree growing out of a different tree. Uh, Patty, they're or, or, orchids or, or, or orchids. Beautiful flowers, beautiful when you see them, they're growing out of other trees. And I was just, you know, really blessed to see that. I was like, wow, I never knew this could happen. Oops, I lost it there. Give me a moment. I'll just go back to my. Last verse. Hmm, sorry. Oh, the connection? Oh, I see. Anyways, if, if you have your Bible, turn it to John 15, verse 5 and 6. John 15, verse 5 and 6, and that will be our last verse. Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. I love what verse 5 says. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And this is also one thing that we talked about during camp meeting. <laughs> Staying connected to Christ is our only hope. It's our only way of not being deceived, not being deceived by the darts of the devil. <laughs> because no matter what Satan will throw at you and me, as long as we are grounded in Jesus Christ, we will not be moved. We will not be moved. So brothers and sisters, my prayer is that as we see all the deceptions and all the fear mongers going on around us, you know, stay, do not be troubled. 
Do not be afraid. Focus on Christ. You know that that's the devil at play, and he likes to do that. And if you realize that, that there is deception and fear in it, that is the devil at play. Know that God gives us the freedom of choice and that God wants us to operate out of love for one another. May God bless us all.